Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 179, I chat with industry consultant Mike Heiss about HDMI 2.0 and Ultra HD TV. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded October 18th, 2013. Episode 179. Don't call it HDMI 2.0. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and Director of Content at AVSForum.com. This week's guest geek is Mike Heiss, an industry consultant, um, journalist, analyst, and overall bon vivant. Hey, Mike. Welcome back to the show. Hey, hey how you doing today, Scott? And doing CDF great. Cedia Fellow, so that means I'm jolly good. Ah, yes, indeed. I forgot that one. Cedia Fellow, and there, therefore you are, in fact, jolly good. <laughs> Hey, those who are uh, watching the show live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Mike as we go along, and I'll pass along as many as I can. Now, we are pre-recording the show. This is Friday the 18th, uh, because on Monday, Mike, you and I will both be at uh, the Simpty Technical Conference in all an all-day affair on Monday, a special uh, technical symposium on Ultra HD, sometimes called 4, 4K, which we won't tell Joe Kane we said that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we should learn a bunch of stuff. But I wanted and, to and get... interestingly, there's a business session and a technical session at the same time. So at that's the same going to time. address a lot of the issues. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I myself, I'm not very interested in the business side of things, although I suppose I should be, uh, because if the business doesn't work, we ain't going to see it. <laughs> exactly. But of, of course, I'm more interested in the technical aspects. And here on Home Theater Geeks, uh, well, we're all geeks on this bus, so we want to know about the tech. And I wanted you to come on the show before that, that symposium. Uh, we will, the show will be broadcast during the symposium, and hopefully we'll be learning some new stuff. But in the meantime, uh, there are a number of issues regarding Ultra HD or UHD, which is this new uh, ultra high definition format, has four times the number of pixels that HD does. <laughs> HD is the new standard definition, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> and but but there are many other things to consider besides the number of pixels. And well, that, I, sorry, go right ahead. I, I'd say not only to consider, but uh, one of the things you're talking about, Simpty, um, I got the latest issue of their uh, journal uh, in the mail earlier this week, and it's not just an issue of things to consider, but if I can read a quick quote, uh, research... Uh, research done by the EBU, the European Broadcasting Unions, Beyond HD and Broadcast Technology Futures Groups has proved that providing a clearly perceptible improvement over HD requires, emphasis mine, a lot more than just four times resolution. There are questions concerning high frame rates, HFR, high dynamic range, HDR, increased color space, and more. Each of these uh, contributes and it, it sort of goes on, but it basically says that if you want something that's perceptibly better than HD, man does not live by resolution alone. And that's from, you know, guys who do that for a living. Right. <laughs> and we follow it for a living, so we should know too. Or, or we watch it for a living. Or we watch it for a living anyway. Yeah, exactly right. And this is exactly right because particularly with, with companies bringing out UHD TVs that are 55 inches diagonally, 65 inches diagonally, um, and thinking about how the eye perceives detail and what's the minimum tiniest little thing the eye can see, when you're when you're sitting nine or ten feet back from a 55 inch TV, you can't really perceive the improvement in detail just by having more pixels. So there's much more to it when when people sit that far back from a TV of that size and say, "Yes, I can clearly see a difference. It really looks better." They're not really talking about resolution. They're talking about other things. And, and color is, is, uh, is really high up on the list among them. Yes. 
Exactly. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But one of the things, the thing I want to start with, with you, you at Cedia, the Consumer Electronics, uh, Custom Electronics Custo Design. Custom Electronics Design and Installation Association, but they right. don't use that anymore. Just like NPR is just NPR, Cedia is Cedia. <laughs> okay. So at the Cedia show uh, two or three weeks ago, uh, you were teaching a course on HDMI, which is yes. the... Uh, the means by which the signal, the video and audio get from the source device to the display and to the audio system, but we're talking about displays today. And there's a new version of HDMI that but was just... But you can't just... call it a new version. You get a nasty <laughs> letter from Steve Venuti. Well, can, can we call it a new version even if we don't number it? Well, that, and that's where I think they've actually dug themselves, quite frankly, a bit of a marketing hole. Yeah. Matt, we can call it that, but if you are a manufacturer or in HDMI legalese parlance, an adopter, if you are someone who sells products, you're prohibited from putting the version number on the product. And at one point that was allowed, but it hasn't been allowed for some time. So what they want you to say now is HDMI with. So uh, right now you'll see HDMI with deep color, with CEC, with ARC, and so forth. Oh so, man, that that could that could mean though that that what you call the the particular type of HDMI on a device, it could extend out HDMI with ARC and CEC and deep color and this and that and this and that and one thing and another, ends up being a you know a big long thing. That that doesn't seem reasonable. And, and it's it's even worse than that because. Uh, and I've spent, as you know, more than a few years working with some manufacturers, and it becomes cumbersome because some of the things that uh, might be recognizable perhaps here uh, with the home theater geeks is, is gibberish to the consumer. So if I were to say HDMI 2.0 at 216060 60 with 420 color or the same thing with 422 color, Consumers aren't going to know what that means, and, and no. it's going to confuse people, and I think the HDMI people are quite well aware of that, and they're, they're really grappling with some sort of standardized terms and perhaps some education that they're going to have to do so that people know what the Sam Hill this stuff means. <laughs> well, it's typically referred to, certainly in the press, you and I refer to it this way, Everybody as H does. HDMI 2.0. Correct. Now, the previous version that that was the most recent before this was 1.4. So why do you suppose they didn't go to 1.5? They don't want to use numbers at all, but they do still. I mean, it's 2.0. They just, I think they really wanted to show that there's a, a fairly significant, and um, there, if you look at the progression from the initial 1.0 version through to the 2.0, this is a fairly significant change in terms of the, the capabilities of the system, all the things that they've, that they've added in and the increased uh, clock speed and, and data rates. So I, I can't speak for them, but I think they wanted to really show that this is a significant change. Now, we have, a, we have a, an image to show people uh, called HDMI Evolution. Uh, that shows, gives us some idea of, eh, it's difficult to see uh, in the little window I'm looking at anyway. Uh, but it, it, it gives you an idea of the progression of things from uh, the date initially released, a uh, maximum bandwidth, maximum resolution, uh, different characteristics from 1.0 to 1.1 to 1.2 and so on. Uh, everything had eight channels. And uh, the early versions had a bandwidth of almost 5 megabits per second. And then we jumped to 1.3, which had 10.2 megabits per second. That's quite and a And remember, jump. that's where 3D started to come in. Ah, okay, One at 1 1.3. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that was in 2006. And that allowed, uh, again, still eight channels of audio and uh, somewhat higher resolution um, and then we went to 1.4 in 09, still the same bandwidth, 10.2 megabits per second. But and now that's, we could... that's where 3D came in at 1.4. 1.4. Okay, that's kind of what I remembered. Um, but And it also allowed a resolution of 4096 by 2160, which is what we call true 4K. 
That's not what these Ultra HD displays are. They are uh, 3840 by 2160. They're slightly less wide. Um, and, and there are many products on the market today, TV sets, AVRs, the source devices that are delivering 4K, the Sony upscaling uh, Blu-ray players. They're delivering a 4K upscaled image out of that device on 1.4B. Have to, have to be slow to, to make yeah. sure you say it correctly. But right. the point is how far you want to push that. And, and unfortunately, I think that's going to cause... Uh, some measure of confusion with consumers as well. Well, and that's what we want to address today. I want to try and dispel yeah. that confusion with you, with your help, uh, because it, it is very confusing. Um, because, and I, I think we should point this out at the outset, that a lot of manufacturers are now saying, hey, we offer HDMI 2.0, even though they aren't supposed to say it, and they'll probably get a nasty letter from Steve Venuti, who's the president of the HDMI licensing Association and has been on this show before, in fact. And he's a uh, really good guy. He takes a, he's a really lot, good guy. Of, a lot of heat. Yeah, he does. Um, and we're going to hold his feet to the fire here a little bit because uh, HDMI, a lot of companies are saying we now can deliver HDMI 2.0. And which, technically they can. Yes, but there's more to it than simply uh, the, the big thing about HDMI 2.0 that so many people have talked about is. HDMI 1.4, the current standard, was supposed to be able to deliver 4K resolution at 24 or 30 frames per second, but it couldn't do 60 frames Perfect. per second. And this was important for sports and live TV. It's not important for movies because those are delivered at 24 frames per second. So 1.4 can do it, but it can't do 60 frames per second. So and, here and the, the color depth and the color sampling. And see, there's a there's a bunch more to it than just it the resolution, yeah. right? See, I was I was trying to point out here that they're saying, oh look, we can deliver uh, 4K at 60 frames per second, so we're HDMI 2.0. But that's an incomplete story, isn't it? Well, again, that's where you get this with HDMI with with what? Yeah. And Depending upon what the what's that, depending upon what the what is, uh, that's where you draw that. That's where you have to uh, caveat emptor. Right, exactly right. Um, let's see. I just saw something here. Oh, Doctor T in the chat room is asking, uh, what about DisplayPort? Well, uh, actually, Panasonic has introduced a set with DisplayPort 1.2, which right. will deliver the equivalent. Uh, video signals as HDMI, but DisplayPort is pretty much confined to the uh, computer world. And, and there are just so many tens of millions, uh, billions perhaps, of HDMI equipped devices out there. DisplayPort is fine, but I just don't see a radical shift. People aren't going to wake up one morning and, and change to DisplayPort. No, I don't think so either. I've been asked this question many times, and the ans and the answer is DisplayPort has many advantages. For one thing, you don't doesn't require a licensing fee, right? And, it's free and to you use. could even say Thunderbolt as well. Uh, Thunderbolt yeah. 2.0, if you're a Mac head, uh, will also do the same thing as HDMI 2.0 or DisplayPort 1.2, but it's it's in a fairly limited universe of of Apple based products. Right, and that's the thing. In the consumer electronics world, generally, and certainly the AV world that you and I live in, mostly, um, HDMI is ubiquitous, and I don't think standardization gonna... rules. Yes, and and if you... even if it's not the best, beta was better. HD <laughs> right. DVD was better. I haven't had many HD DVDs playing lately. No. Although I do have a, a, a fan, actually, in Switzerland who has asked me for any and all HD DVDs I can spare because that's what he loves to watch. So it's not I, completely to, dead. Uh, how much would he pay for the DTS demo disc in uh, HD DVD? You know, he might pay something for that. You and I will talk <laughs> offline about that. <laughs> okay, well, let's take a look at the fa at what HDMI 2.0 really sure. means. And we have a we have a diagram or a, a list anyway that will show 
uh, the various, here we go. Well, here's the, the key, key features of version 2.0, which we can't really call 2.0, but we're going to call it that anyway. And those are the widths when, again, so I think the first two are not quite ubiquitous, but that's what people are going to drive towards. But the caveat is that to really go to the 600 megahertz and 18 uh, gigabits per second, that's where you're going to need new silicon. So those iterations of this 2.0 will require new chips. Uh, the other things, it's, it's somewhat to be determined because it depends on how they're implemented. So it's, it, it's still pretty squishy. Exactly. It's pretty squishy, and that's the weird thing. Um, and, and each the of these is, is important in its own right. Remember, at some point along the line, uh, SACD capability was added. There are some that that's important to and, and some not. Yeah, yeah. But, for example, we went from eight channels of audio to 32 channels in uh, HDMI 2.0. So, uh, you know, we could, we could... That's going to depend fact on other factors, though. Right. 32 discrete channels. That, that's, you know, a topic for another day, perhaps. Right. Um. Uh, a wider color gamut, which is uh, ITU Rec BT 2020, which we're going to talk about which is later. Really important. Yeah, which is really important. Uh, we're going to get to that a little later. Um, the the big question, though, is you, you mentioned you mentioned just a moment ago, and this is really a key point that I want to make sure everybody understands. HDMI 2.0 can mean different things. It, it it's really HDMI Correct. with one thing or another or one thing or another. If you add certain things, if you say with X and Y, you can in fact do it with current silicon, the chips that are in the displays right now. All it needs is a firmware update. That's the general understanding. That's what, uh, it, it's my belief. And again, some of this is shrouded in manufacturer mystery. But uh, <laughs> at Cedia, we were both at the JVC press conference. They announced they're going to have an upgrade for some of their uh, 4K projectors. Sony has announced that for the earlier, uh, or I'm sorry, the current. In fact, there's a good way to to sort of capsulize this, the latest Sony 4K sets will be able to be upgradable via firmware. The right. earlier ones will require a hardware change. Right. And, and then some of the other features of this new version of HDMI will require a hardware change of actually Indeed. new chips in order to implement them. And there are no HDMI true HDMI 2.0 chips yet because the spec was only finalized, what, a couple months ago? Uh, it, it was announced and uh, apparently approved right before IFA and CD at the end of August and early September. Right. I, I think it's fair to say that the uh, chip manufacturers, and there are uh, two primary manufacturers of these chips uh, and then some other specialists, were maybe, let's say, about 75% of the way along. They didn't not do any work waiting for this standard to be finished. Yeah, they, so uh, the question now is that they have the final test, the final specs, how long will it take to finalize the chips, take them uh, to compliance testing? And the compliance spec isn't done yet. So uh -huh. that's another little detail. Uh, so but they can't, they can't a, even verify them at this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, not only can you not verify them, it was only within this past week that Quantum Data, which is one of the primary manufacturers of the test gear for this, announced the availability of the test suite. So not only do you have to wait for the standard to test to the standard, but then the test equipment has to be updated so that it knows what to look for. So that, right. that those are just some of the sort of crazy moving parts in this whole, you know, cogs and wheels thing. Right. <laughs> Andy in Germany is asking, why don't they just add more wires to the cable? <laughs> uh, because then the cables wouldn't be backward compatible. Right. And, and that's as I understand one of the it key things here. Yes. Good point. Also, I think most of the pins in the HDMI connector are already taken up, right? You, could, you couldn't. I think there may be one left or something. There, there are no available pins that you could use for something else. And backwards compatibility was something that they really wanted to maintain. I think that where 
and, and, and the HDMI people, if you go back and read the announcements, and, and, and I would certainly encourage people to go to the uh, HDMI websites because they're all posted there, that the cables are, no new cables are required, but the general consensus, and there are a lot of people talking about this at Cedia, that when you go beyond kind of three, four, five meters, you may need an active cable to maintain the signal integrity. So it's no new cables are required, but there's a but there as well. Right. I, I imagine that if you're going to try and carry 18 gigabits per second with a clock speed of 600 megahertz, uh, your effective cable length is probably shorter than it is yes. with current technology. And and what the what the HDMI people when I did uh, my HDMI session at Cedia with Jeff Park from HDMI who's also another really good guy, uh, as he explained it, they didn't make the pipe bigger; they made the pipe more efficient. And and some of this is just not available. the 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 ways that this is being done are are just not available to the outside world. They're they're. Uh, in the NDA uh, material that, that only the adopters have. So they've made the transmission more efficient to double the speeds as, as you've seen on the chart. But it, it's going to, time will tell how this really works out in reality. So I think now would be a good time to take a look at the chart that you sent, uh, which shows all the different parameters and combinations and permutations that HDMI 2.0 uh, yep. can can in fact uh, convey, and when when you need actual new hardware and when you don't. Exactly, and uh, it's interesting. You can see that here's where the moving parts come into play. If you want real 12-bit color, uh, yeah, 12-bit color, you can do it at 216030 with 422 sampling. If you want 60 frames per second, you can do it, but you've got to restrict it to 8-bit color and restrict the color sampling to 420. Once you move below on this chart, that double line, that's where you can see the, the doubling pretty much. And these are numbers that were provided to me by uh, HDMI. Uh, they're not the actual numbers that are required, but they're the the maximum of the pipe, if you will. They're the they're the width and capacity of the pipe. Once right. you go above that 8.91 or arguably 300 megahertz, that's where you've got to switch to the new chips. The new chips. Okay, so technically, you can do 2160p. And Dr. T in the chat room, yes, 2160 is UHD. Uh, Indeed. Uh, yeah, and you can do it at 60 frames per second, but only with 8-bit color and only at a sampling rate of 420. And we're, we're going to explain what those terms mean because particularly the color sampling is very strange and very difficult to understand. Well, it's not really that hard to understand, but not very many people do. So we're going to help you understand it right now. Uh, but first, the bit depth, the color depth. Uh, wh what are we talking about there? What does that really mean? Well, it, it, it refers to the number of pixels that are used to describe the color so that uh, if you want more saturation, and, and, and this is something, I mean, this is a Joe area where you've got the 8-bit, 10-bit, there's even 16-bit color. This is going to give you strikingly more color, much, much, much better more color. saturation. Really what exactly. we're talking about here is, is the number of bits that are used to represent the saturation of a color. So I, with eight I, bit, with eight bits, we're, we can we can have two hundred and fifty six different steps. Right. It's uh, it's not quite a perfect analogy, but it's it's close enough without being confused with where we're saying color sampling. But if you talk about um, uh, 41, 44 one audio or forty eight audio or ninety six audio, uh, right. it, it's a similar kind of concept as to how many bits you're using to describe something. Well, and actually, wouldn't it, actually wouldn't it be more uh, more accurate to relate the color bit depth to the audio bit depth in audio sampling? Sure, that, sure, th sure. That, uh, absolutely. S standard CDs are forty four point one kilohertz sampling rate, sixteen bit. There you go. Exactly. Um, uh, 
uh, depth, which, which basically, the, and the bits in that case refer to the dynamic range. What is the softest and what is the loudest sound that you can re reproduce? And CDs use 16 bits. These days, high-res audio uses 24 bits, which gives you a greater dynamic range. So similarly, we're talking about dynamic range of, the, of each color, red, green, and blue. And we represent and them with 8 bits, this, 10 bits, 12, or more. Exactly. And then underneath this, you know, there's somebody is, is going to ask, but what is the material shot in? And everything right. now is predominantly shot in 8-bit. But as, as things are moving to uh, uh, REDs and Sony F65s and, and cameras of that nature, you're getting the ability to do a 10 and 12-bit and color. So it will become more important as time goes on. You also have to have the panels have the ability to to describe all of this. So, right. again, there's just enough moving parts. They better be well lubricated. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Okay, so we got bit depth now, uh, which basically represents the dynamic range of each color. Yes. Um, the color sampling, uh, we hear these terms floating about, 4, 4, 4, 4, 2, 2, 4, 2, 0. Um, and these, no these numbers are separated by colons, just as in printed nomenclature. And I wanted to try and explain what that means. Because if, if you don't understand it, it's kind of just numbers and gobbledygook. But if so, you do, you are a home theater geek. <laughs> so I want to educate my audience to make sure they understand what these things mean. And to do so, I have borrowed some graphics from Spears and Munsell. Uh, now, Stacy Spears and Don Munsell have uh, created one of the most widely used, most popular test discs called a uh, High Definition Benchmark. They're now in version 2.0. They've been guests on my show, and uh, you can go back and, and look for them, and they will talk a lot about... Um, their disc and what you can do with it. And it's really quite, quite good. And also on their website, they have uh, a really nice explanation of this whole color sampling thing. Uh, so th the way they do it is they start with RGB and they say, are basically all full color images on a TV or any display uh, are represented by combining three different colors, red, green, and blue. And we have a picture here that we can show that has a full color image on the left. Might, might want to zoom out a little bit there, uh, depending on... If, you, if you're in 16 by 9, you're probably seeing the whole thing. You can divide that into red, green, and blue. And that is the best, really the best way to represent a full color image. Well, not really the best way, but certainly the most... Um, That's the way it's coming out of the camera, if you will. Right. Okay, thank you. That's exactly right. Now, you can, through mathematical machinations, uh, convert RGB into something called YCBCR. And the next slide uh, shows us what, what that sort of looks like. Uh, Mike, why don't you uh, tell us what Y and CB and CR uh, why? Why? Because we like you. Uh, why is luminous? I, I couldn't help the help it. You couldn't one. help it. No, no. Yeah, this is not and, the Mickey Mouse Club, but okay. No, and and actually, uh, Mark Shubin, who's uh, a longtime acquaintance of mine, an Emmy Award winner, a video historian, has always uh, posed the question of why it's Y and not L. Hmm. For luminance. It should be L for look because it was taken by something else. Is is the easy answer. Mm. Um. But the CB and the CR are the color difference samples, uh, color difference signals that are used as you take that out of the camera RGB to make this signal more efficient because this all relates to, and this will tie back to our, our numerical chart, is to how much bandwidth, how many digits, how many bits are required to describe the signal. Uh, you know, how much of the liquid do you want to take out of that orange juice uh, to to make it a concentrate? And that's <laughs> what all, that's what all of these schemes are really about. They're they're actually forms of compression of data compression 
or the way the signal is manipulated to to make it more efficient and at what point and that's where somebody and and again i mean we kid about joe but but joe kane but but he's right that you you want the highest possible uh quality you're going to need everything sampled on every line but if you just don't have the bandwidth uh, something has something's got to give right and the way they've decided to do it here in this particular transformation is to extract the black and white information, call it Y. Yes. And then two color difference signals called CB and CR. And, 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 and I'm sorry. And again, because every time we do this, it, it's important to remind people that that's because the eye will see the difference in luminance, in the black and white signal, if you will, much to a much greater degree than the color change. Right. So the Y or the black and white signal actually gets more bandwidth than either of the color different signals because the eye, as you say, is more sensitive. A four. Right. So, um, so that's called, uh, f that, that is also called 444. Um, and what that what those numbers refer to is, interestingly, the video signal, the video image is still represented by horizontal lines. You remember in the old CRT days, you actually had horizontal lines being drawn on the screen by an electron gun. Well, now you have horizontal lines of pixels on a digital display. You could call it vertical line, vertical columns of pixels if you want. Sure. But... But instead, they, they still call them horizontal rows of pixels uh, because that's what it, the way it used to be in the old CRT days. So you know, on every line of, the, uh, of a 444 or YCBCR signal, you have four pixels that represent the black and white, and you have four pixels that represent CB, and you have four pixels that represent CR. Correct. Uh, so... If then, you go to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go right ahead, please. No, so if you, so 444 four, four means you're always sampling every pixel. But right. then if you were to sample them at every other pixel, both horizontally and vertically, then you'd have 422. Right, which is as, our next so, slide. Right. And then if you were going to, but if you wanted or needed even more efficiency, but before you go there, before you yeah. go there, I know where you're headed, but before you do, let me just say that one way to think about 422 is to say the two color difference channels, CB and CR, are actually uh, basically cut in half horizontally by resolution. So there's only half as much resolution in the horizontal direction in the two color difference signals as there is in the black and white signal. Right. And again, this is this is okay because um, the eye is much more sensitive to brightness, so changes in brightness than it is to color. So that's why we can get away with cutting the resolution of the two color difference signals in half horizontally. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, next step. So then the next step is if you were to have it again, if you will, yeah. and and. Instead of it being four and then everything on horizontal and vertical, everything on horizontal and then sort of in the middle. So you're getting a much more efficient coding because you will uh, you're using less bits. And and I'll just throw one other thing that uh, there's invariably going to be someone who's going to say if you look on the back of uh, of a device, you'll see PR and PB, and that right. represents analog. So uh, just for clarity, that's why here it is, it's CR and CB to, to connote that it's a digital notation. Yeah, and why they used C for digital and P for analog, I honestly don't know. Uh, why? Because we like you. I mean, it's, it's the same. <laughs> as you said before, right. <laughs> exactly. There, there are people who get paid a lot of money for that. Yeah, uh, that's true. And that ain't us. And not, well, actually, it's mostly done by committees, quite frankly, and they're people who really they, they don't get paid a lot uh, or, or right. anything to do that. But if, if uh, John, if, if you could put that slide back up, w what that's showing is you're still getting a good picture. And, and it, it would be easy to look at this and say, well, gee, you know, 
it, it's not as much it's, it's not going to look good but the thing that's on the right is is pretty much what you're watching today if you're right. watching the take two video that's what you're seeing yeah and let me just make sure that everybody understands that what we're talking about now we went from 444 to 422 and now we're at 420 and in 420 um the color um uh, color signals color different signals are cut in half by resolution horizontally and vertically. Exactly. Uh, and so you've got very little resolution left in the color difference signals. But believe it or not, as Mike just said, that's what you're watching when you watch broadcast TV, when you watch Blu-ray. Even mm -hmm. Blu-rays are encoded in 420, which means there's very little color information. It all has to get reconstructed and interpolated by processing. The information simply isn't there to begin with. And so it's remarkable to me how good Blu-ray looks even when the color information, the RGB information, has been coded into 420. Uh, you would think it would look lousy, but it doesn't. And well, But then here's another piece of the puzzle. This is a, a good point to introduce the gamut over which you're doing the sampling. This is another one of the moving parts. So yeah. it's not just the, the the depth to which you're sampling it, but the, the the picture that you're sampling. So what you're looking at here, and again, I, I uh, believe that uh, the, the, the listeners and, and uh, uh, podcast viewers have probably seen this before, and this is the, the CIE, uh, 1391 color space that everybody's seen. But uh, nine, the, 1931, actually. 1931, I don't know, which was a very good year. Uh, I guess I'm uh, dyslectic today. But <laughs> if you look in the middle, you see that somewhat smaller triangle in the yellow outline, and right. that's HDTV. That's what we're watching today, and it's governed by this standard Rec. 709. And the UHD TV standard, which is Rec 2020, and that's also, I mean, honey, I can't sleep past the Rec 2020 do document. It is safe, <laughs> it's safe and non-narcotic. And, and you can Indeed. go to the ITU website and, and download it, and it is, it's mind-numbing, but what this shows you is that, with the D65 in, in the middle, is that that shows you is that you're looking at a greater color space and that's really where, I don't want to say these displays begin to shine, but that's where you really begin to get the benefit that that fellow was talking about in this Simpty Journal article about bits aren't the whole deal here. A it's resolution. The, Red pixels aren't the whole red, whole deal. Yeah, pixels any. aren't the yeah. Pixels aren't the deal. It's the combination of how many frames, what's the color space, what's the color depth. All of these things together are what really gives this UHD TV system not just one aspect of it, but the whole system, the the really incredible images that it's it's capable of, of producing. Right, and why when you sit nine feet away from a 55 inch UHD TV, it can still look significantly better than a standard HD TV. If all of these things are present. Right. I said can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Might possibly look better uh, because of all these other factors besides simply the number of pixels on the screen. It's just uh, harder to get that message across, and that goes back to the HDMI thing. It's harder to get that message across to the consumer that wants to spend uh, not a lot of money to buy a good TV set in a warehouse store, or at a big box store, or online. They're not, they're not going to buy a, a high-end TV set. It's just not something that's of value or perhaps affordable this is still going to represent a considerable improvement, but it may not have all of these pieces. Exactly. Then there's the issue of video processing and upscaling, because one thing we yes. haven't really talked too much about yet <clears throat> is content. You mm -hmm. mentioned, you alluded to it a little earlier about, about what are you shooting in? What are you, how are you capturing the video image? What camera are you using? What bit depth is it using? What color space is it using? What frame rate is it using? Um, and all of that stuff has yet to be resolved. There just isn't very much native UHD content 
available on the market yet. I mean, Sony is putting out uh, their films from Sony Pictures onto their server in this UHD format, but that server is only box. compatible with the hat called the hat box because that's what it looks like. It's only compatible with Sony TVs. So right there, I think it's a big strike against it. Well, I, I presume that there must be some uh, rights issues that are uh, uh, that are res that are responsible for that, and over time that will uh, certainly be resolved. Uh, Netflix uh, will offer uh, uh, 4K or you know UHD content at some point down the line. Uh, you've got the World Cup and the Sochi Olympics next year. There'll be some content recorded back there, so the content is coming. Yeah, but in the meantime, you're going to be watching Blu-ray uh, at 1080p with the Rec four, Rec 709 color space in 420 yep. chroma sampling, color sampling, on these UHD TVs, which means the UHD TVs need a video processor that can upscale that content to fill the screen. And we don't know that's yet. That's a critical, and, and that's one of the critical differentiators. There are people, uh, brands in the market now with less expensive... Uh, 4K resolution sets, if you will, and then there are the, the major brands. And one of the differences that, that consumers and, and buyers really uh, have to look at is what is the quality of the upscaling? And just as it was in the early days of, of HDTV, uh, how good is the scaling? Because that's what the sets are doing. And there are those who say that the uh, the newer entrants, some of the uh, the Chinese brands, uh, the scaling just just isn't quite that good. Whereas on the Sony's or in the uh, Toshiba uh, server Blu-ray box that has the Marseille chip, uh, which I think you and I saw down at Technicolor a month or two ago, it, mm -hmm. it was really quite good. Right. This company, Marseille, by the way, Marseille Networks, I think, is the name of the company. Marseille, as in Marseille, so. Marseille France. Oui. Uh, oui. Uh, <laughs> uh, has developed a an upscaling chip that they're then licensing or marketing, selling to different manufacturers to put in their Blu-ray players or their TVs or whatever. Uh, and it's actually been certified by Technicolor as achieving a certain level of performance. Technicolor certification of for 4K upscalers is not oh. unlike THX certification. THX, exactly. Yeah. So and, and 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 it is pretty good. Yeah, it is. I saw it. I you saw it. I saw it. I was yes. very impressed. And and that's where I mean even in the in this internet uh age, this is something where I, I personally I'd be very reluctant to buy one of these sets unless I could view them side by side and have them uh, fed by uh, a decent source so that all the other calibration issues that, that we might normally want to apply aside, you can at least look at the motion compensation and, and to see if there's any blocking or pixelization. Because then you get into the question of, should I buy a 4K set with a not so good scaler and depend on the scaler in my AVR. And there are a number of AVRs in the market in this product cycle uh, from pretty much all the major brands that have some some really good upscaling in them or an upscaling DVD, uh, Blu-ray player. Does that compensate for a not so good scaler in the TV set? You know, I always say, if you're a geek like me, uh, you want to try the scaler in each of the stages of the signal path. Exactly. You, want to, you want to do it in the Blu-ray player. You want to do it in the receiver. You want to do it in the TV. Take a look at each of them on the same content and see which one does the best job. And then that's the one you use. But, but then also to recognize that uh, the sources are going to change because uh, let's say 12 or 18 months down the road, there's uh, 4K content or UHD content available from Netflix. And I think that, that sooner than later, that will be there. You're then going to make sure that you're hitting the set at the right at the right range how how is this stuff going to look there's yet even another 
moving piece here. Uh, there are different compression algorithms that different companies are using to encode the 4K content. Uh, exactly. Sony, Sony is using a technique called IIO, E-Y-E, -E, small letters, capital I, capital O, whereas the industry at large is uh, gravitating towards HEVC or H.265, which is at least one better than H.264. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the question is, um, when will that be built into devices? Because if you're receiving the streams, you need to be able to decode them. So if you recall, uh, at Cedia, LG made a point of uh, saying that some of their new 4K sets uh, were among the first to have this HEVC uh, capability built in. Right, exactly. Um, and I assume that the Sony sets must have this IIO uh, built into them, although I don't remember ever seeing that spelled out explicitly. And, and 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 I think on purpose that they consider that that's a don't worry don't 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 worry your little oh, head. Don't worry about, about it. We'll, now. We'll, we'll take. Don't look look over there. Uh, <laughs> we'll take we'll take care of this. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but Netflix has also been looking at that technology uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that it will be interesting from the production side to see what pops up at the Synthi conference is when there'll be the ability to real-time encode in these signals. Remember, the Sony uh, hatbox, there's no live streaming into that product. It's a, a, a download and store because it, it just takes more bandwidth than, than is required and a lot of other things. But right. one of the demonstrations that I'm looking forward to seeing uh, next week is perhaps of some of this live encoding. Right, exactly. Which would, which would give us then the ability to stream as long as you have sufficient bandwidth coming into your house. That's yet another issue yeah. which the manufacturers and the industry can't really address. But, you know, in order to stream UHD, you either need extreme compression, data compression. Or extreme bandwidth. Or extreme bandwidth, or one or both. Uh, or iPad, a little of each. Oh, yeah, indeed. iPad Duo Che in the chat room is asking, what does RED use for... 4K content codec for their player? And the answer is they have their yet another, yes, their, their own, own proprietary codec, which stands for coder decoder, um, which MPEG-2 and H.264 and H.265 and all these things we were, we're talking about now, they're examples of codecs, which data compress the data down to a point where it can pass through a given pipe. Red and uses and if you Red has its, its own, C yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, if you recall with Cedia, both the JVC and uh, uh, a couple of other folks at Cedia were using the Red Ray player, but yep. yet then you go back in the other direction, there's no HDMI 2.0, so that was using four 1.4 outputs connected <laughs> I to I know, the that, 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 that player, the Red Ray player, which is available now for, I think, $1,700, $1,800. dollars $1,795. Okay, I call that eighteen hundred. Every day, um, local price. Yeah, indeed. Uh, it's available now. You can buy it. Uh, it it will uh, play out four K or UHD content. But in order to get all of these uh, parameters that we've been talking about, you need to connect four <laughs> HDMI cables to the display. And I don't know any yep. displays that, that can do that, except possibly Red's own laser projector, which we still don't know what's happened with that. That seems to have gone missing. Yeah. You, you need Agent Mulder to find that one, I think. Indeed, indeed. The truth is out there. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, uh, iPad Duo Che, uh, it, Red uses its own. And and I think Google is, has announced and yes, one. And, and right? Google has got their own as well. So if YouTube... Uh, which which they own is going to go and and do that. Then you've got yet another scheme, and this has all got to be baked down into chips. You don't want to do this in 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 programmable products. You need, you need to have the efficiency of having high volume chips with these baked into it. So right. is there going to be one winner, two winner? Remember, DV. Uh, I keep saying DVD. Blu-ray has three options for compression. Uh, right, they have MPEG-4, MPEG-2, MPEG-2, VC-9, 
and one other that escapes me. You've got Dolby Digital and you've got DTS. Right. So th th this wouldn't be the first time that this is going to happen. There's a fairly significant push, I think, on the content creation and post-production side towards HEVC, H.265. And again, right. we'll, we'll know more about that uh, within the week. But there are many business and political uh, relationships that govern as well as just the quality and the technical, what goes into a consumer product. Right. The best man does not always win. No, as we've seen, you, you mentioned earlier, beta beat out VHS, even though it was better. Other the uh, way around. H uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. VHS beat out beta, even though beta was better. Um, uh, Andy in Germany, Andy Germany is, is asking if uh, anyone knows where he can download an H.265 codec. Uh, and I don't I know. I don't believe you can do that yet. And then what would you load it into? I mean, exactly. I mean, well, into a computer. If you're using an HTPC. Uh, I don't think you can download it as such, but you'll probably sooner than later see it embedded in players. Right. In fact, old geezer here is asking, uh, are these compressions going to turn into another VHS versus beta war? It may very well be. Uh, well, but you, but but I think that the better model for that perhaps is uh, DTS and Dolby. And there are two systems that arguably do the same thing, but there are two of them for, for a variety of, of different reasons. Right. Uh, and, and I think, and, and as is the case in Blu-ray uh, on the video codec side. So you may see different formats and you'll see different formats for, for different, uh, uh, different applications. The broadcasters uh, may use a different format uh, for what's called mezzanine to get the product from a remote site or a broadcast center to a transmitter or a central, uh, central control point than is used elsewhere. So it, these are the things that just aren't settled yet. The market, right. the market will ultimately dictate this. Well, I guess so. I was going to say before I answer that or just respond to that, uh, the difference between the VHS beta format war and the compression format war is that compression is all software. And so, yeah. you know, if you have enough, if you have enough storage space and processing speed, you can implement as many of them as you want. Uh, VHS but, but and it's, beta. It's, it's political. It's who's licensing what from who. Um, what are your uh, manufacturer alliances? What are your chip alliances? And, and, and this really gets into consumer electronics uh, industry politics. Uh, the reasons why VHS uh, prevailed over beta, uh, you know, are, are many and, and some known and, and some sort of under the covers. But it was, it was a financial uh, thing, uh, as plain and simple at the end of the day. Yeah, so the, my question there is, was it really market-driven, at least free market-driven, or was it driven by the financial concerns of the people who were behind it, and could the same thing be true here as well? Yes, and, and that would be the market that, that I, 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 I uh, align it with here. Mm -hmm. It's the market of there were... You know, how many brands at the time, a dozen people making VCRs and JVC was uh, peddling one format and Sony another. And, you know, who who said what about whose ancestors and, and, <laughs> and who has which political alliances, you know, yeah. things of that nature. And, and it's also related to patent rights because that's yet another sort of hidden from, hidden from view thing. Uh, you mentioned the display port is royalty free, but in yep. some cases, some of the companies throw in together in patent pools. And, and that was an important element in the HD DVD versus Blu-ray war. Right, right, exactly right. And there again was, though it was also a hardware war. Yes. Rather than a software war. But, but, but tied in, but all of it, it's, it's, it's all sort of, you know, stirred into the same pot. <laughs> Indeed. It well, gives us something we, we'd have nothing to talk about. Exactly. we got plenty to talk about. And especially now in the early days of UHD, 
with all of these things up in the air, you know, uh, which which is why I wanted to do this show was to let people know, hey, there's a lot more to it than just the number of pixels. And we're going to be talking about this on more than this show because uh, these things need to get settled down. So that leads me to my next question, which is, in your opinion, should consumers buy a UHD TV today? It depends on it depends on what your specific needs are. If I, I use the example of my my old apartment in in Manhattan years ago, that I think my office here is bigger than my whole apartment was <laughs> uh, in, in Manhattan those years right. ago. Yeah. If I wanted the spaces to find and my nose was in the TV set, and I date myself, I could see the scan lines because yeah. I just wanted a big TV. If I want a bigger TV and I don't want to be able to, to see the pixels, then maybe, and yeah, you can afford it. There's nothing wrong with some of the 4K sets that are out there today. If you want to make certain that you don't buy a set where there is some possibility of a piece of the hardware chain being obsolete sooner than later, mm -hmm. then you might want to wait. There's another uh, another way you can look at it. Do I want to buy a name brand or do I want to buy one of the new emerging third tier aspiring to be second tier aspiring to be first tier brands? Uh, right. Some of the less expensive 4K sets, some people would say they're not that good with video, but if you hook them up to a computer, they're pretty good. So it's moving parts and you have to see which ones are important to you. So the answer is a definite maybe. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're taking a stand on that. I, I absolutely, I, I'm not buying one right now. I'm, I'm going to wait. Yeah, yeah. Somebody in the chat room, and I'm tr looking back to see who it was and I can't find it right away, uh, mentioned the Seiki 50 inch. Uh, UHD mm -hmm. for like 1200 bucks. Right. And um, I think Jeff Morrison, who's been on the show, uh, did a review of that and found that when it was playing native 4K content, and I don't know where he got it, uh, it actually looked pretty good. But when it was upscaling, it was not looking good, which gets back to the point we were talking about earlier. Exactly. And some folks that I, I work with in the semiconductor world who have bought some of those and taken them into their labs and fed them direct 4K signals, which these folks are capable of doing, said that when fed with a 4K signal so that you're hitting the panel at its native rate, it's not bad. But if you're feeding it broadcast TV, it might not look too good. Might not look too good. QNX Monkey in the chat room is saying, is asking, can we adapt 2020, this this new wider color mm -hmm. gamut, uh, without going UHD? Uh, you could, but I, it, it's just unlikely to happen because that's uh, defined. It's who's the we? I guess there's the answer. The <laughs> uh, the current standard is what's used in all the production equipment. Right, which is 709, so, which is that yellow triangle, that smaller triangle. Right. So if you had a TV set that was 2020 compliant, you're back to saying how good the scaler is, but it, it can only improve it to a certain point because of the limitations on the incoming material. Exactly. Now, at CES last year, last January, this year, still this year, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, both Sony and Panasonic... Uh, made a pretty big deal about how their their TVs, their latest TVs, the color gamut, the range of colors that it could produce, that triangle in the CIA right. diagram, was larger than Rec. 709. And actually, I've heard this for years from TV manufacturers saying, oh, we've got this wider color gamut. And my response has always been, yeah, but the content coming in has been mastered to that Rec. 709 triangle. And so if you expand that out beyond that triangle, what you're reproducing is actually inaccurate compared to what the uh, content provider, producer, intended. And, and there are all sorts of potential pitfalls, and that's where 
I, I would say that anybody is really, again, this is honey, I can't sleep material, is uh, <laughs> to get the digital video book written by Charles Poynton, which is 500 pages of this stuff. <laughs> and one of the things that he talks about is when you're doing these conversions, especially from something like 601 to 709, 709 to 2020, if you don't do it right, you can really hurt it. Right. Exactly right. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, 601 is the color triangle, the color gamut. Uh, for standard definition television, right. which is slightly right. smaller than 709 for um, high definition. There, there isn't too much difference there. But then when you jump from 709 to 2020, you get a huge difference. There's a lot more colors that you can reproduce. But again, the content had better have it encoded in the data to begin with, or all that extra color is useless. And, and you mentioned Sony and Panasonic, and, and I'll sort of give them a generic uh, buy on this. They make production equipment, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they, they know what they're doing, right. but there's only so much that you can do. Exactly. And, in fact, in fact their it, argument— again, caveat emptor. Yeah, their argument uh, when I asked them about this was, well, we, we know what we're doing because we capture a uh, greater gamut than, the t than 709— then when we make a Blu-ray, we bring it down to 709. But we know what it was originally supposed to be, so the TV intelligently expands it back out to where it was supposed to be. Well, I'm sorry, but that's, that's interpolation. That is estimation. It's guesstimation. Uh, and they may sometimes know it'll work and sometimes it won't. Exactly. Uh, and, 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 you know, again, you pays your money and you takes your choice. If at the end of the day... If it looks good to you, the person putting your car, credit card down to buy the set, it doesn't have to look good to me. It doesn't have to look good to you. It doesn't have to look good to Joe. It has to look good to you. And if it's good enough to you, as is the case with anything in this, I'll say, hobby, the same with, with audio. I, I went to too many loud concerts. Uh, I'm sure you, you know. I, I, did, I played too many loud concerts. I had too many loud concerts, so... What sounds good to me isn't going to sound as good to, to my son, who's 27. Right. Right. Exactly right. Okay. Well, it, one last question. Sure. And that, and that is, and, and this is a question I get quite a bit of the time, actually. Here we are talking about 4K or UHD, <laughs> and it's, you know, all these questions are swirling around and not yet determined, and yet people say to me, well, what about 8K? It's you know, that's, that's coming down the pike. Why should we even worry about 4K? <laughs> and, and the answer is, if you wait to buy, now I'm going to contradict myself. I said I wouldn't buy one today, but if you wait to buy in anything associated, as Leo would say, anything with a chip in it, right. if you wait to buy anything with a chip in it, you'll never buy anything. Yes. 8K is coming. I saw it at NAB this year. They did some uh, 8K uh, image capture at Carnival in Rio this year and at the London Olympics, and it was stunning. The color was superb. It it it, it sounds trite, but it it the color depth. That's where you could really point to it. Was so good that it looked 3D, even though it was a 2D flat image. Mm -hmm. But if you want to wait till 2020, then you can and buy we're talking, an 8K. We're set. talking the year now, not the color standard. Yes, the year, not the. <laughs> there's a Scott Wilkinson laugh. Yes, indeed. Um, and and uh, there will be for sure 8K demonstrations uh, down in Rio because uh, uh, NHK, who's the Japanese uh, broadcaster, and TV Globo in Brazil are are very close. So I'm sure there'll be some demonstrations from there. But the Japanese uh, NHK folks have said that this is really aimed towards consumer acceptance in 20, the year 2020. But then you also have to look at where the cost curve is going to be. There really aren't any 8K flat panels. The only one I can recall seeing is uh, the Sharp that was at CES uh, right. last year and this year. Yep. No yep. one else has shown a flat panel in 8K yet. Right, right. So I, I, I will end by saying I agree with you 100%. If you wait for the next big thing, You'll never buy anything. So get what looks good to you, as you said, 
and what Indeed. sounds good to you in terms of audio and enjoy it because it'll Absolutely. look good and it'll sound good for a long time. Um, you know, if it you may don't be super enjoy it, don't buy it. Right. If you're going to enjoy it and if it's good for you, that's all that matters. I couldn't agree more. Well, on that note, I will say thank you so much to thank you. Mike I, hope, I hope we've cleared some cleared some things up and, and not caused too many more questions, but more maybe confusion. someone will answer them next week. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, next week I do uh, have uh, Joe Kane scheduled to come on, and uh, that'll be after the SIMPTI conference that you and I and Joe are, are all yep. going to. Uh, so he will have plenty of high, very strong opinions about what happened there and about what we said here today. So That would, that would surprise me. <laughs> what, Joe, strong opinions? Never. <laughs> now, uh, if, people want, if people want to get a hold of you um, or find out what you're doing, uh, where would they go? Uh, well, I am uh, appear regularly in the pages of Residential Systems, which is resmagonline.com, Hidden Wires, which you see on the screen, uh, which is uh, more of a European orientation, but I am uh, appear every month, uh, hiddenwires.com, and um, you can get me on the Twitter thing, at Captain, ooh, Captain Vid, C-A-P-T-N, no A-I, my, my bad for not pointing that out to John, Captain Vid, uh, at... Uh, it yeah, is which is on Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, yes. C A P T N V I D. V -I -D. It's a bandwidth thing. When I first uh, got my <laughs> AOL email, I won't tell you how many years ago, you could only have, thank you, John, they could only have eight characters. Oh, man. So that's name. that's how you ended up with that. Uh, and with and that so screen people name. just know me as Captain Vid. So <laughs> I, I use that. Hilarious. Hilarious. Well, thanks, thanks again, Mike. Scott. I really appreciate it. All right. That. You can find me, of course, at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. You can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott or at avsforum. And you can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here on twit.tv slash htg and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twithometheatergeeks. <clears throat> As I said, next week, uh, my guest geek will be Joe Kane. Uh, we will have just returned from the SIMPTI conference and uh, have plenty of things to report from there, I'm sure. So I do hope you will join us for that. Until then, geek out.